This is session 12 for May 10th, 2020. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there and those in attendance. Uh, just wanted to welcome everybody into the room, go over the ground rules quickly, and then jump right in here. Really, another uh, amazing uh, trend setting uh guest this evening so i want to jump in really quickly and, and get as much out of steve as we can but uh, ground rules for the evening we are recording this for the purposes of saving the world one conversation at a time uh and for the record on the tiger king question that we'll get out of the way early with steve this evening uh and um so that we can archive going back in time i don't have official word of the ceus just yet but they are coming so hang with me on those and then we can retroactively uh, get everybody set up with the cata uh, for sessions attended previously all right so that is all the ground rules for the evening i believe and we're going to jump right in here with our guest. So uh, an amazing guest tonight. Um, uh, not much more I can say. I don't really have words to describe him. So let me just jump into his bio and, and then we'll, uh, we'll get talking with Steve and, and you'll get a good feel for him right away. Uh, Steve Lidstone is our guest this evening. He's the Associate Director of Sports, Me sports Performance at Brock University, where he manages the sports medicine and sports performance departments. He's the former head and strength conditioning coach at York University from 2004 to 2007 and the strength and conditioning coordinator at McMaster University where he had a huge impact from 2007 to 2016. Steve is a strength and conditioning consultant with Hockey Canada's national women's team since 2005 and he also consults with various Canadian national teams, basketball, bobsleigh, wrestling and water ski Canada. Steve has been a sessional instructor at Sheridan College, McMaster University, and Redeemer University, and presents at various conferences annually. He currently sits on the advisory board for the Registered Kinesiologists of Ontario and the Canadian Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association. Steve resides in Niagara-on-the-Lake with his wife, Christy, and their three amazing children. Steve is proud to call Niagara his home and has now focused his passion for athletic development on youth, varsity, next-gen, and professional athletes in the greater Niagara region. So that is our guest from a formal standpoint. Uh, from an informal standpoint, Steve has been uh, a mentor from a distance. For me, he's impacted Canadians on so many levels. Uh, he's carved a path for athletic therapists. He's carved a path for, for strength and conditioning specialists. He's carved a path for, uh, for athletes. And uh, just a huge wealth of knowledge, a really welcoming guy, um, matter of fact, honest, and just brilliant to listen to when it comes to his systems, his way of thinking, and, and the way that he formats things um, uh, with, with the athletes he's working with and the students that he's working with uh, in terms of education as well. So, Steve, uh, I'll let you say hello, and then we'll jump right in. I really appreciate having you here tonight. I know it's, uh, it's Mother's Day, so it's been a busy one on your end, too, um, and, and you had that, that conference yesterday. So I appreciate you making the time, man. Welcome to Let's Chat. Yeah, James, thanks for having me, man. It's, uh, it's great to chat with you uh, and just join everybody on the call. Uh, you're right. Happy Mother's Day to everybody out there. Uh, and a special thanks to all the frontline workers as well that are working uh, tirelessly through this pandemic as well. So just want to thank everybody for having me and uh, looking forward to chatting tonight. Absolutely, man. Uh, I echo those sentiments as we all do as we keep going through these times of, uh, of uncertainty and unprecedented, um, you know, weeks and days and months of, of just sort of the new norm that is. And we have those people out there doing those, uh, those, uh, that amazing work on a regular basis to keep things moving. So uh, thank you for that as well. Um, it, it's an interesting time and you and I chatted briefly uh, and then I, I listened to you yesterday on the NSCA uh, regional uh, conference chat as well. So um, maybe just give us a, a little oversight as to what you've been up to, how things have shifted for you and at home as well as work uh, with this time where we're away from what we're used to. Yeah, truthfully, I think I'm more, I'm busier now than I've ever been. Um, I, I, you know, I think I'm more, I'm easily accessible, I guess. And, and so, um, you know, our, my work days, you know, our days on average, we start off, we have three young kids are 11, nine and five. So, uh, we're homeschooling them all right now. So my wife as a nurse, she works full time, um, or close to full time in a, uh, as a dental surgeon's assistant. Um, so she's not in the hospital, but she still is in full PPE gear and, and, and working with uh, emergency surgeries or essential surgeries, uh, uh, through dentistry. Um, 
but uh, the average day for us, we have three kids. We wake up early in the morning, 7 a.m., and are homeschooling. So roughly 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And then I start work from, from then until roughly 5 or 6 p.m. And then, uh, and then homeschooling again in the, in the evenings uh, with whatever is left over. And then uh, for me, it's a unique situation. Uh, in that we are, um, we also live uh, in a neighborhood where my nephew lives, and he was just drafted to the Barry Colts. So uh, we're getting him ready for uh, his tryouts coming up, hopefully in August or, or September. Um, you know, and so uh, training with him on a daily basis as well. And he's he's uh, we're pushing each other, so it's it's been uh, it's been interesting. So I guess the upside is there's a you know less commute, uh, which isn't a long commute for me anyway, from Niagara on the Lake to to Brock. It's roughly 20 minutes, 25 minutes, but. Um, it is an opportunity to, uh, you know, I guess the upside is you step out of your, your workspace and you're right into, uh, you know, training or, or with the family. The downside is there is no uh, buffer between your workspace and the kids. Uh, so if any of you guys have watched uh, Dude Perfect's uh, stereotypes of uh, uh, COVID-19 or the coronavirus, if you haven't, you got to check it out because I'm, I'm the first scene by far where I've got shorts and then, you know, the top is, is dress attire and, uh, and I've got two kids I'm carrying around the house and it, it's kind of, you know, that's, that's what our, our environment looks like now. So if you haven't seen that video, check that out. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I think this is just like a picture of, of some kind of, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, I don't know. It's like a sitcom over here too. You know, like I tried talking to you on the phone, just like, Hey man, how's it going? Let's catch up. And, and you had, uh, <laughs> you had a full on, uh, a full on Lego and I need your attention because you're doing something else session with me with me on the phone. So apologize and appreciate you sitting through that one. But I know I know you empathize, I think. Um, how, how old are your kids now? Uh, 11, 9 and uh, 11, 9 and 5. Yeah. OK, so you're you're uh, you get the whole gamut going for you. And, and uh, congratulations on your on your nephew as well. That's pretty cool. You mentioned that the other day when we were chatting and like, yeah, what an, what an amazing time to sort of just tap into some of these things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do, right? You get to spend a lot more time with your family. You get to spend a lot more time probably training him that you wouldn't have otherwise unless he was coming down to see you at the university or something like that. And um, that's that's kind of it, right? Counting the blessings and making the opportunity work as opposed to, to getting hung up on all the things that we can't do. And that's been really a nice thread throughout all the guests that I've had on here and all the people that are here on a regular basis is is really making the most of it and, and building this network and this community and you know you're still part of the AT community very much uh, overseeing that now as well at Brock which is fantastic uh, for anybody who doesn't know we'll get into Steve's background and all of that but um, yeah just this is kind of the angle of things from an AT sort of heavy perspective uh all welcoming for sure um but with my background sort of uh, using this opportunity to network and connect and have these conversations where you can share dialogue so uh, appreciate you sharing a little bit of your personal stuff and uh i'm sure we'll get into a lot of your professional stuff as well yeah for sure um all right so uh, you're, you're at brock now which is uh close to my heart uh i'm uh did my undergrad there um, as a Badger. Yesterday you presented at the NSCA Great Lakes Regional Conference and you had the cutest little slide of the, uh, the little baby Badger and, and your, your little program or not little but your model of like how we build a Badger. I thought that was just like a great visual really helped me and took me back to when I was uh, well that baby badger but I think I had like my hat on crooked and probably something that shouldn't have been in my hand while I was I don't know walking down the street or something like that but um man what a big shift from what Brock was like when I was there to what it's like now um it was great with the with the practitioners um when I was there as a student and worked as a student therapist but now oh my gosh the performance realm uh dive in man where is that thing when you when you took it and, and where is it at now where is it looking to go yeah, you know what? It's, it's been an interesting journey for me because I think you know, if I backtrack, you know, working, being hired as, as a, a strength and conditioning coach slash AT combo at York University right out of graduation was a blessing in itself. And then I was able to stay there for, you know, three years working obviously professionally hand in hand with uh, some of the greats. Um, obviously, Darren Worry would come in and help out. Um, I mean, there's so many people that you can you can talk about. Gus Candelas. Um, Cindy Hughes, Tracy Maloche, I mean, like the list goes on and on, but you just have all these great professionals that, you know, we would work with at York. And then, 
you know, after a period of three, four years, the strain itching aspect wasn't calming down at all. And there was no real vision for support at the time. So uh, McMaster came calling because we started beating up on them in sports. We, we had no right winning uh, OUA titles, things like that. So made the shift over to McMaster where I, I was a coordinator for our full-time strain itching coaches, but they had me oversee a lot of the reconditioning in the clinic as well. So they, they gave me a, a nice healthy budget to build a, um, a reconditioning center um, that was basically half court, half turf uh, with, you know, video analysis, you know, Kaiser's on the wall, all the equipment that you would want to recondition an athlete. So we did a lot of work in that room uh, and a ton of, uh, ton of memories of just helping recondition athletes. It got to the point for me at McMaster where, um, you know, I wasn't overseeing a direct team. I oversaw football for quite a few years, um, you know, throughout our Vandia Cup years and things like that. And then I started to, um, you know, draw back a little bit and, and um, basically oversee specific athletes. So on each team, I'd pull athletes aside and screen, assess, collaborate with our, our athletic therapists, uh, Chris Puskas obviously is, is one of the legends It's there. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, Carly came in as well. Um, you know, Kelsey Marshall was there for a period of time, but then also our physios, um, you know, and just working alongside the Colleen Caputos of the world and then other physiotherapists, um, you know, Sue Robinson, like you just work with these great people and you start to really um, create a, a, a vision of, of what, uh, you know, complete holistic care looks like in a multidisciplinary setting with our docs and Doc Levy and Doc Robinson. And anyway, you just, you go through and you're working with the athletes and, um, you know, I would just really work individually with key athletes on each team that we needed to get healthy. A lot of our CFL prospects, things like that. And so I, although I was coordinating the strength inching, I never stepped away. In fact, I delved even deeper into just screening human beings. Uh, more than anything, from a therapeutic aspect, I obviously, you know, had my FMS background, but then started with the SFMA and then the whole time working with Hockey Canada, going to their national team camps, convincing them that the entire sport med group had to take the SFMA together. So Hockey Canada funded uh, for 70 of our therapists, transition coaches, doctors, massage therapists, all of us to take the SFMA at the same time. Uh, a three-day course uh, with Bernard, I call him Bernard H, but uh, Bernard Hornbash was, was basically out of um, Vancouver. Um, and then, you know, having him come in and do the SFMA with all of us and then start to screen athletes at May camps and provide individualized reconditioning work for them pre-session, post-session, uh, and homework to take home. Uh, it was really awesome. Uh, and then, you know, along those lines, uh, I started – Hearing whispers as I, uh, from the Brock community, uh, in particular Joe Kenny, the legend Joe Kenny, oh, uh, guy. he had me come to his house and start to train his daughter and his son because he knew I lived in the Niagara region. Uh, so Erin Kenny was uh, probably 15, 16 at the time. She was getting ready to play university basketball where she plays at Windsor now. Uh, his son Chris as well. So I would come over and, and uh, provide programming for them. Uh, at the time, I used a program that uh, Darren McConaughey, myself, and Sean Jeffers uh, put together called Propulsion. Uh, it was an online training format, much like you would see with Team Builder or Trainer Heroic now, yeah. where it was all video-based programming. So that, that was throughout my McMaster years. Uh, we had filmed all those exercises and put together this software through a, a website uh, designer and, and, and sold it actually to numerous NHL teams. Um, but uh, during those years, Joe would have me come over, train his kids, and he would come down in the basement and literally just write notes. And I'm, I was just, I, I didn't know what was going on. I, like this, here's a guy in AT with 30 plus years of experience at the university level, just taking notes. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he would just have me come over week after week. And after maybe two, three months, he actually brought me out onto his front porch when I was leaving. And I never had the intention of going to Brock. I just was, you know, uh, delighted to just help out his kids. Um, and he said, he goes, you know what? I really appreciate your skill set. He goes, would you ever think about coming to Brock? And I never thought of it up until that light bulb moment, to be honest. Um, and then uh, surely uh, after that conversation, I started to think about it a little bit. Like, the, you know, the bug was in my ear. And then I would, you know, drive to McMaster from Niagara-on-the-Lake, which I did for 10 years, and would drive over the St. Catharines Skyway and look to the Brock Tower that was there and be like, wow, that is so much closer. <laughs> uh, and with three young kids at home, it, it became more and more appealing. So, um, you know, and not only that, but working in Niagara and, and – or sorry, living in Niagara, working in Hamilton, you never felt like uh, you were building your community the way you felt you wanted to and, and uh, or impacting your community the way you wanted to. And so 
um, you know, slowly but surely things started to work in that direction. And Robert Hilson was um, in charge of our entire um, marketing and, and AV and, and uh, media section at, uh, at McMaster and was hired as the athletic director at, at, uh, at Brock. And he would come to events and just kind of nudge me and go, how do I get you to Brock? How do I get you to Brock? So there's all these pieces started to work. Uh, that way, and then uh, during some of those formative years, um, the way it all came together was I was working with Jesse Lumsden quite a bit uh, post-op uh, while he was a CFL, and then we trained him for for uh, um, for bobsled and uh, for the Olympic Games. And, and uh, his father was hired as the athletic director. Neil Lumsden, the great Neil Lumsden, was hired as the AD at Brock. And I guess Jesse put the bug in his ear and. and, and Anyway, I, I attended a, a McMaster Brock game at Meridian Center, the great paint the Meridian red games that we have where there's 6,000 people going bananas. Uh, it's one of the best atmospheres for, for U sports. Um, and Neil was there and he pulled me aside and, and uh, walked me around the concourse. And, and just, you know, a, a, two, three weeks later, while I was working at McMaster, we were having meetings of could this work? And um, it was difficult because I love McMaster. I never wanted to leave. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, they, they gave me an opportunity to teach. Uh, coordinate staff, do what I wanted to do without really a lot of people telling me what I had to do. And, and I, I just really enjoyed, enjoyed the autonomy that I had and just the flexibility of my schedule. And anyway, long story short, that's, that's how I ended up at Brock, man. It, it, it just, all the, all, all the things came together and, and uh, you know, I didn't want to leave McMaster. I said, you've got to have this and this and this in place. So I knew I didn't want to be the lone transition coach like I was at York with 14 teams. I knew I needed a varsity athlete only facility. I knew we needed to have a good collaboration between sport med and sport performance. Um, so all those pieces came into play um, and uh, you know, that, that was it. It was enough to, to, for me to, to make the, the decision and move over and, and, and start to work at, at Brock. So that's how it all happened, man. That's, that's, that's a long story, long and short of it. Yeah. But you know what? I think that story is, is like uh, we could end it right here. Cause that is like, all the things that are important in a career, sometimes we lay it out and we say, I'm going to be here by this date. I want to be here. I want to be doing these things. And you never really know until you have good conversations with people, you align your value systems, your structures, and, and what you see as important, and you get an mm -hmm. opportunity, and then you, you meet people along the way. You mentioned so many names in that story um, that my face was just like, I was grinning ear to ear. I mean, Joe Kenny off the top was my mentor. Like he basically got me into the AT world. I was playing for the baseball team at Brock. And then um, he ended up saying like, hey, what, would you consider coming over and doing some stuff? I know you're interested in the human body. And that's really where it all started. And then uh, Andrew Robb, I don't know if you know Dr. Robb. Uh, yeah, you know him yep. pretty well, I'm sure. Um, he, uh, he was our student trainer at the time, student therapist. And that combo of like Andrew Robb and Joe Kenny was just bam. And then you mentioned like that was light bulbs all the time for me. And then from that point forward, I stayed in touch with Joe and then got in touch with you. And, you know, I think you were at York um, at the uh, at the tail end of your time at York when I started the AT program there after graduating from Brock. So we had a little bit of overlap and, and then Pusky and Dr. Robinson at McMaster, just amazing people that uh, took us in when we were there as a, as a visiting team when I was working with York football and, I still owe Joe Kenny. So if you see him, uh, I still need to pitch to him because he always said when I was pitching on the baseball team that he needed to stand in the box to see if he could hit a, a fastball off of me. So <laughs> he's, he's, he's sharp, man. Yeah, I tell you, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if he did. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. He's, he's a pretty darn good athlete. Listen, he'd, he'd take me yard without question. I think this sitting about – uh, there's not much left in there. It's probably about 65 miles an hour sitting right on a cupcake for him. But anyway, um, yeah, what, what a good story, man. What a, what a huge career you've had an impact uh, across uh, Canada. Um, at, at Brock, even since you've been there, uh, it hasn't been long, but the teams have really, I mean, we, we, we don't necessarily equate a linear translation to on-field success, but, but the teams have really taken off since you've been there as well, right? Like recruiting has obviously shifted a little bit. You're a huge part of that process now too. Yeah. Um, and women's volleyball did really well. Women's basketball did really well. Yeah. Like, so, so do you see that? Like since you've gotten there, um, you've been able to help away from the gym and, and the, the programming setting as well. Like are you being used as a recruiting tool? I'd imagine you would be. Like I would go to your school if, if I had the opportunity. Yeah, I would say more and more. I mean, it, it, at first, truthfully, my when you, I learned a lot, I made a lot of errors at York and McMaster. I learned what I wanted to do differently this time. I had one more chance. I knew I'm not. I know I'm not going to try and do this again. To be honest, I, I uh, you know, starting a new program at, at three different universities takes a lot of energy and it's quite exhausting. And 
Um, you know, the, the piece that made it interesting for me at, at Brock was um, opportunity. There was opportunity everywhere. It was, it was still in its infancy. The school was young. Um, and, uh, and although the athletic therapy program there is very well established, thanks to the work that Joe did, uh, Jim Bellotta, Karen Millar, they've been there for 25 plus years, all three of them. So, uh, you know, they've really, um, put a lot of a great work in and, and have built a great program, uh, and a development system for up and coming athletic therapists. Um, and so uh, while they're studying in undergrad, I think the big thing that I would say is when I was brought in. Uh, I was brought in just to oversee the sport performance side of things, strength finishing side of things. So they, we built a, you know, a, a 4,500 square foot um, weight room with turf, uh, and I can show pictures if you guys want, but turf and, and and the weight room itself. And then, you know, over the years we've put pieces into it. It was a culture shift. Uh, it really was. They hadn't had a regimented strength finishing program there before. Uh, and what's nice was I was able right away with Neil, we set up a budget and I knew I had to generate revenue in order to do this, but I wanted to hire full-time transition coaches to work underneath me, much like we had at McMaster. So um, Neil was great in getting that set up uh, and then allowing me to do that. So besides helping me create the, the facility, it was now hiring transition coaches to come in. So uh, I oversaw four teams and then right away, like I was hired in August, uh, I, I uh, interviewed our full-time transition coaches um, and we hired Dave Scott McDowell um, as well as Vicki Bendis uh, who are amazing people <laughs> themselves. Uh, I was really fortunate that Vicki was already there doing her master's, had been there for a period of years and was entrenched in the university and, and wanted to be a transition coach there. So uh, although she had to earn it, we had a panel. Um, she had to earn the right to be there. Uh, she got seven unanimous yeses out of the panel that we wanted her to be hired. Uh, and then oh, Dave, probably out of six, right? Like seven out of six. She's like, she's fantastic. <laughs> she is, she is by far, in my opinion, one of the best female transition coaches in, in North America. Um, I, I would really put her up there with, with quite a few. So, yeah. um, she's been amazing. Um, and then I hired Dave Scott McDowell. So initially it was the three of us. Uh, and then uh, a young gun named Taylor Thiessen, who was studying uh, Con Ed um, in, um, to, to be a phys ed teacher. Uh, Vicky actually talked to him on the last day of application in his last year to apply for our transitioning internship. And he, he did on the last day and got in on women. Uh, I mean, just this guy has all the intangibles. So within a year of being on our program, I knew I needed to hire him on uh, as a strength coach. So uh, basically now we have myself and then the three of them. And then we have, um, you know, uh, 43 students that work underneath us in sport performance. And then on the sport med side of things, when Joe retired, uh, this is how it all changed. I, I came over and for two and a half, three years, I ever saw sport performance. But then Joe retired last year um, in, in 2019. And when he retired, uh, right away, the upper management approached me and said, would you like to take over? We'd like for, would you like to? It was like, we'd like for you to take over the sport med portfolio and did to it what you did to sport performance, which was just build it up and, 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 uh, and just make, you know, necessary tweaks. So that's what we ended up doing. And uh, honestly, it's all thanks to Joe Kenny. I, I honestly take my hat off to him. Um, he had the vision when he actually showed me his strategic plan from maybe six, seven years ago. And it was strength conditioning was the big piece he wanted to bring in before he retired as long as, as well as electronic medical records. Uh, and those were the two pieces that he had built up prior to retiring. And uh, it, it is thanks to his vision um, that I'm here. So uh, I, I really give all the credit to Joe, to be honest. Yeah. Well, I mean, Joe deserves credit for probably half the athletic therapy population, you know, <laughs> in Canada, his, his impact is just about everybody in some way or another. And I was lucky enough to get under his wing while I was there and, and learn a lot from Joe and stay in contact ever since. And, and you mentioned Vicky as well. Like we, we have some, uh, some paths across as well when she was still playing, uh, for a for the women's national team. Um, she was training with Adam and then she had a little thing going on. So she popped up to the clinic uh, with Adam and I started doing a little bit of work on her hip and groin and, and then her wrist and then all the other things that were going on as she was finishing up her career and what a little powerhouse. And, and I, I imagine that translates over to, we had lots of discussions as to um, where things were gonna go. And then she ended up at Brock and, and we stayed in touch ever since too. So really, really amazing that uh, um, the, the people that you've brought in, what you've done, what you've been able to accomplish accomplish um, just at Brock alone and then we go back through your whole career but um, it, it brings me to a point that, that we've talked about um, with every guest and that I love talking about with every guest that comes on here and that's putting the human first and and on our NSCA the, the regional conference yesterday to a person everybody mentioned how important it was to put the client 
life uh, in front of you at the center. All the bells and whistles and funky tests and things that you know are really irrelevant if you don't have that, that um, client or athlete-centered focus. Um, but for you, I, I just want to shift gears maybe and ask you about um, hiring people, like your personnel. H how do you evaluate you know, who's going to fit and who's not? Obviously, credentials are a big thing. And I'd ask the same thing about, um, about you and getting to Brock. But let's start with your hiring process and, and the people you bring in. What do you look for in, in those people that, that sort of separates them from everybody else? I know you have a panel, but your you're, yeah, you're insight. Yeah, I would say every the, the interviews that I do, and I, I, we do, oh gosh, um, between we do roughly 80 student interviews for Sport Med a year and 80 sport performance. So I usually do an average of 160 to 170 interviews a year. And I also sit on a lot of interviews for the university now to hire upper management people. So um, I've now really been a part of the HR process for uh, quite a few years uh, and, and did that at McMaster for 10 years as well. So I would say I've sat in on a lot of interviews to the point where when I had my interview for Brock, I knew exactly what I needed to do to impress the panel and, and just, uh, and, and I would say this, number one is the people that we look to hire, usually the interviews that I'm a part of, you either have like two stages of interviews or for our sport performance and sport med students, we have half hour theory and half hour practical. Um, and really what we look for in the theory is, is humility. Uh, we look for people who put family first or people first, um, caregivers. Um, we look for qualities that are endearing, but at the same time confident. Um, and, and when you put those things together, you usually end up with a pretty good therapist and a pretty good transition coach. And um, we also look for people who do their homework. It's amazing to me how many people apply to major positions at the university who don't know who the panel members are, haven't spent time on the website looking at what the university vision, mission and vision is, right. uh, what, what are the important details for that university, uh, what is the staffing structure. You wouldn't believe how many interviews I sat on where I'm just like, wow, didn't do homework. X, like just gone. Uh, and so at the end of all my student interviews, and these are, we use these for experiential education, to be honest. At the end of every single, uh, like we have groups of four that come in every hour uh, for 80 for sport med and 80 for sport performance each year in, in roughly March. Um, and every single time the interview ends for that hour with that group of four, I always give them this feedback. I always say, number one, when you're asked if you have any questions, if you say no or not really, it means tells the panel you didn't do your homework. Uh, you should have at least eight to 10 questions fully typed out with your homework supporting each question so we know what we're getting. Um, that's step one. Step two, you only get one chance to make a first impression. Always wear a suit and tie or, or like sharp dress for females. Like you've got to make sure that, that you're professionally dressed and, and make that impact. Um, and then the last thing for us when we're looking at them is not only how they dress, uh, also the, you know, the questions that they have at the end, but overall, just to leave a lasting impression is that handshake at the end. It's, it's the overwhelming just personality that you bring to the table. Um, for me is, is what really separates a lot of people. And so that's when I'm hiring people, that's what I look for. The last thing I'll say is I hire people with different skill sets. If everybody is the exact same, we're not going to get better. Um, every single person on your staff should bring a different attribute or different uh, level of expertise that makes everybody else better. Uh, if we hire a whole bunch of clones, we're just going to be clones ourselves and not get any better. So I, I just look to that. And, and I also look to people with passion. Um, we need to see people who truly want it. But at the same time, uh, although at a university setting, you have to work in your environment, you still have to wear multiple hats to help others. Uh, and are you that person that can actually, you know, have vision and, and, and the ability to make an impact across the board in other areas? I think I learned that most from Hockey Canada. Doug Stacy, uh, the great physiotherapist for Hockey Canada, I remember my first national team camp. He pulled me aside. He said, look, if you want to stick around here, once you're done, you're, and I, it wasn't that I had done this yet, but he just told me beforehand. He's like, this is the expectation. Once you finish your duty, you help out everybody else. So when I was done cooling down my athletes and they're getting showered or whatever, I would come over to the therapist and help with cleaning tables, uh, putting equipment away, you know, cleaning the cold tubs, whatever, it, whatever I had to do to make sure that I was never standing still for a split second until we were all on the bus. Um, you know, and that, that really had an impact on me is that's what I look for with my staff. Um, and with hockey can hockey can has taught me more, more about professionalism and, um, and, and just excellence and, and, uh, more than anything, how to conduct yourself as a professional, uh, because of Mel Davidson, 
Julie Healy. I mean, you mentioned some of the, the you know, the great uh, general managers that we've had, um, you know, but uh, overall it's just, you know, the, the um, I don't know, just the attention to detail. Like when we would get up to eat, Mel Davidson wouldn't get up until everybody would eat. The general ate last. And I still, I do that too. Like when we have staff uh, Christmas parties or, or anything like that, I don't get up and, and, and eat until everybody is finished. Ladies first, gentlemen second. Like we have just different rules where, you know, I, I think those are the big pieces that uh, we look for when we're hiring staff or how we, we set up things. I just look for people with those, that attention to detail and those attributes. Yeah, man. What a, what a hugely beneficial conversation um, for anybody in the room that's, that's just coming out or looking to change gears or looking to change directions to hear uh, somebody with your insight, your impact, and, and your, your, the depth of your practice um, from that angle. I think all of those are crucial. I wouldn't obviously argue any of those points. And, and some of the things that pop back uh, to some of the guests we've had before, Dan Church is on, was on here earlier, uh, the women's coach at York. And, and he said, you know, it, he, he makes sure that he helps pack the bus and unpack the bus on the late night road trips because it starts from the top and it makes it makes its way all the way down to, you know, and I don't want to even say down, but like across the entire roster and staff. And, and what a, what an amazing um, insight to hear that from you as well and and uh, and just not standing still and that goes for student therapists and internships and all and and for all of us you know and and for me the biggest piece that you touch on um is that stagnation right is like looking for vari variability in your staff and looking for people who are willing to to drive the bus when the bus needs to be driven but sit in the passenger side and and you know play co-pilot when that's needed or sit in the back and just observe like what a crucial, uh, what a crucial interview set and like skill set to, to to hear you touch on and to have uh, you bring to the room. Um, in terms of Brock, when you were going over there, when they were bringing you over there, it's it's obviously not one thing. You have a huge background. Your credentials are massive. Uh, your all of your um, your success is 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 well known. Uh, what do you think made them really want you? in terms of like bringing you over from McMaster other than Joe and like, obviously you have a good, good uh, uh, quality uh, relationship with him working with his kids and, and being right down the street and things like, I know why I would want you, but, but what do you think Brock, uh, why do you think they, they drew you in? Um, man, I, I think they were looking, especially on, on the performance side of things to have someone who had done it before and could hit the ground sprinting. Uh, they wanted to get the program caught up in a hurry. Um, and so I think that was one of the big things was they didn't want to hire someone who had not done it at a university level before. Um, and I think all the stars had to align, to be honest. I, I do think, you know, it was the right place, right time, and, and it's worked out. Um, I'd say from a, a personal standpoint, um, I don't know. I think you'd have to ask some of my staff that, but I think they would say uh, for myself, um, you know, I, I always put my staff first and, and look to develop people. Um, and I think that's what Brock is all about. Um, it's, it, it gets a lot of high ratings within McLean's magazine each and every year because of the student experience. Uh, and so much so that my umbrella now has shifted underneath uh, Dr. Anna Lathrop um, and, and our entire uh, division is called student experience. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's all about the student experience and then finding people who want to have a positive impact and leave, you know, their mark on, on students coming up. And I just think, what McMaster allowed me to do uh, in developing our transitioning program there, in developing the uh, you know the um, the internships that we developed, uh, seeing the success of our students going on and getting positions uh, in various national levels of sport, um, private um, levels of sport, future therapists. Uh, I just think we 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 got pretty good at developing people, I guess. And, uh, and when you're immersed in, in, in national team programs like Hockey Canada, like we would host Hockey Canada Transition Camp every single May for 100 athletes, 35 staff. They would all come to McMaster for roughly six or seven years and allow us to bring in student therapists, student sport performance coaches, young up-and-coming coaches, and bring them into camp and teach them how to be the next generation of coaches. Um, and so I think we got really good at just developing people. Um, and I think when I interviewed for the position at Brock, I was able to show them that, that my vision wasn't just barbells and dumbbells and sets and reps. It was, this is the long-term impact we can have on the student experience and experiential education. Uh, and I think that's what Brock was about. When I use those key words, those, those hot button words, experiential education, it, it, it was because we had the Dean of Kinesiology, Brian Roy was, was, uh, was sitting on the panel, um, 
I really think it resonated with him that this is much more than just a transition coach. This is an opportunity to impact students across the board in their experiential education, develop their exercise library, uh, their ability to prescribe exercise and, and, and assess human beings. And I just think all those pieces, being a dual role applicant for, for me, I really don't second guess that's importance to have a really good breadth of knowledge in multiple areas, but then, you know, to be, to be uh, well-versed in athletic therapy and transitioning just worked out perfectly for me because I think that's, that's what they were looking for was the ability to impact students. They wanted me, they want me to teach obviously, but I've taken a bit of a, because I taught at McMaster and, and started the transitioning undergrad program there. Um, uh, and at Redeemer, um, I, I basically have taken a bit of hiatus while uh, starting at Brock to get everything up and rolling. Um, and at the same time, uh, I'm completing my master's as well in, in motor skill acquisition. So I have to complete, you know, my, my next level of education before I feel like I'm ready to teach others. So um, at a formal level, at least in academia. And I obviously have my, you know, all the appreciation in the world for all the profs and, uh, and, and the amount of work that they do through their master's, PhD, uh, and, and the amount of research that they do um, to be able to teach students. And so I don't take that lightly. So I think it's important that I, you know, lead by example and get my education completed as well before I can teach once again at, at the university level. Yeah, massive, man. What a, what a hugely deep answer. And, and I just, uh, man, uh, from a distance, I have followed you as closely as possible. Never had the opportunity to work directly with you, um, but definitely a mentor and somebody who I look up to. Uh, and, and I've reached out to you in the past and I'll continue to reach out to you until you uh, stop picking up the phone. But um, uh, a massive, massive undertaking. And, and it didn't come uh, it didn't come easily, for sure. You put a lot of time, a lot of effort in. You mentioned that um, uh, in Canada, it's not really at the forefront for, for many universities uh, in terms of performance and you know quality. And so you're bringing other elements in uh, that are um, hugely rewarding for the university as a whole, beyond the field, beyond the, the pitch, the rink, the, the court. And I think that's massive, and, and I think that's important for everybody to, to hear and see as well. Um, for, for those of us in the room that want to follow in your footsteps, uh, obviously ongoing knowledge, uh, breadth of knowledge, uh, these kinds of things are huge. Uh, what would you recommend? Uh, I don't know, some basics in terms of how do we get to where Steve Lidstone is or how do we do some of the things that you've done? Um, coaching, uh, internships, learning books. Obviously, you posted a couple books over here. appreciate it. And I'll post those on the YouTube channel as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, how, how would people, you know, get to where you're getting to? Um, obviously time, but, but what would you recommend? Yeah, it does take time. I would agree with that. Um, I, the biggest thing is surround yourself with, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and better than you, to be honest, uh, and just, and just learn from them. Uh, you must find mentors. I think that's the biggest thing. One of my strongest mentors was Scott Livingston, um, graduating from AT at, at, uh, and having a real big background in transitioning for myself. Uh, I remember approaching Cindy Hughes and saying, who else thinks like me? Uh, and she's like, you got to check out Scott. So I, I went to one of Scott Livingston's reconditioning courses in Montreal. Um, I was there for the morning session on the first day and couldn't stop smiling ear to ear. So he pulled me aside and he was like, uh, he was like, are you enjoying it? I'm like, I love it. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't stop loving it. I literally couldn't stop smiling. So of all the people that were there, he brought me to, he and Jamie took me out for lunch and um, you know, it was just the three of us and he just wanted to get to know me. And, and that to me is the impact that, that a strong mentor can have wanting to invest in people. So, um, I don't know. It, it was just, if you follow your passion and you, you, you show your passion, uh, and you're passionate around about something, you can't hide that. And, and I couldn't hide it. And then Scott noticed it and, and kudos to him because ever since then he started bringing me to Montreal Canadians camps in the summer and, and mentoring me in a way that, uh, you know, where, where just he impacted me so strongly on not just his courses and his, his thought process of reconditioning human beings, but just as a, as a genuine human being. So, um, you know, I, I think step one is surround yourself with people who are, who are doing things at the level you want to get to or who are better than you or, or just who you want to learn from. Um, so find a mentor. Uh, I would say step two, just don't stop reading. Um, read books, uh, podcasts. Um, social media, sure. Uh, truthfully, I don't spend a ton of time on social media. I find it distracting. Um, and, and with three kids, I can't be distracted. So uh, just literature, 
um, I'd say would be the one thing. So when I first got hired, I would go on Human Kinetics and buy, you know, a ton of books, Shirley Sarman's books, Diane Lee, uh, a ton of books uh, on, uh, you know, Greg Cook's um, Athletic Body and Balance. Uh, so for young ATs out there, I would say Athletic Body and Balance uh, was a big book that changed the way that I thought about the human body. I would read that one first. I would read anything by Mike Boyle because he really followed uh, his functional um, training books. He followed a lot of therapists like uh, Yonda, uh, Saruman, uh, and he would he would take their information and put it into exercise prescription in his books. Um, so those two really impacted me. Mark Vestigian uh, at Core Performance really impacted me at Exos. Uh, he impacted the way I thought about uh, corporate fitness and uh, athletic fitness and how he built that model down in Arizona. Um, I, I, you know, those are, I, and I would go down to Arizona and, and, and pick that in Mark's brain or, or do an internship through Kaiser with, with the Exos. That's what they would hold. So I would just try and get across to all these different locations and just pick as many people's brains as possible. But those were the initial books, Athletic Body and Balance, Functional Training for Sport, uh, any work by Sarman, uh, Shirley Sarman, which is um, Movement, Dysfunction and Impairment. I forget what the exact title is, but uh, I'll, I'll get it back to you. Um, and Diane Lee as well. So I read all those books and I would buy a book a month and just digest it and highlight it, commit it to memory, try it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, after I finished doing that and, and then reading research, obviously getting some more literature um, and, and have, finding evidence-based research to support my thought process was big for me too. A, a ton of research on therapeutic approaches being done through mulligan techniques and, and, um, and uh, a lot of work through Australia and New Zealand. Uh, really impacted the way that I thought about exercise prescription and, and therapy. Um, and then from there, I would say, you know, mentor, books, and then courses. Uh, you've got to take a ton of courses um, and find what courses worked. I remember sitting in Cindy Hughes's office as a young athletic therapist and looking at her wall of like probably 30 post, you know, post-grad courses that she took with all the certificates and just going, holy cow, that's a lot. It's a lot, that's a lot of courses, yeah. um, you know, but, uh, the, the biggest ones, you know, for me were just, you know, soft tissue release by Jim Bellotta was a great course that got me hands on and, you know, reconditioning courses with Scott Livingston. Obviously I just hosted one at Brock. We're going to host another one in the next year as, as long as this pandemic allows. Um, you know, those were big courses that taught me, you know, hands on treatment, but then starting to delve more in, into fascial stretch therapy, starting to delve more into, um, you know, mulligan techniques, like I said, um, you know, 50, 50 courses, you know, I don't know, like there's so many that you can take and they're always posted by, uh, CATC on their website every single month. They post out the different courses you can take. I think as long as you're taking two to three a year, you'll start to, you'll start to get better as a young therapist and apply those skills. The other thing obviously was the SFMA course changed my world. Uh, it changed the way that I assess a human being. It changes the way I recondition a human being. Um, if you can get a course with Benad uh, H, I, I can't spell his, I can't say his last name properly, so I don't want to bash it. But he's a former transition coach, physiotherapist, osteopath that puts all those pieces together. So I'd say those three things: courses, books, mentor. The last is a network. Surround yourself with a network of professionals that do things differently than you do. Find the osteo, find the chiro, find the massage, uh, find the natural path or the RD. Um, you know, just find people who can uh, impact the well-being of your patients differently than you can and be humble enough to say, this is what you need to go see right now. I don't need your payment, although I wish I could have it. You need this more than me right now. And then they'll circle back and get treatment with you. So I think the most powerful sessions I ever did were with Darren Worry, um, Darren McConaughey. They're both studying osteo right now. Uh, we would screen the humans. They would they would treat. I would assist with the treatment, and then we would give extra prescription immediately after they got off the table. Uh, and, and that was life changing for a lot of people because they, you know, a lot of people go and get treatment, but they don't get prescription of exercise afterwards. And to us, it really started to reinforce, especially through video. We would see a dysfunction in say thoracic rotation. You know, we would try our traditional skills, which were you know roll downs or, or you know. Um, of thoracic spine or treating you know rib cage thoracic uh maybe even soft tissue and the athlete wouldn't get any better and then warry would come in and he'd be like nah you know I, those those levels are good he went right for visceral stuff and would work on whatever liver spleen 
get that to move better and the athlete would get up and turn better but we would film that and see the differences but then we would then give rolling patterns and correctives ground level and thoracic rotation work and then the athlete would stand up we'd film again and it would be even better uh, and they would hold it and retain it and that was the big life-changing moment for us was recognizing how important exercise prescription post-treatment was for maintaining the new motor pattern or the new ranges that had been found uh, and what skill sets did you need to find now to improve that even more so i would say those are the levels if a young et wants to get better uh, you need to do those things and the last thing i'm just going to say is is put yourself in a position of, of, of discomfort meaning uh, you know apply to work at a national games with a national team where holy cow you're almost over your head um, and there are times where you need to be put in those situations to really get better um, I was really fortunate to work with a lot of national teams early in my career just Dan Church was the one who introduced me to Hockey Canada uh, and then I never stopped going because they were all about developing coaches from across the country and they bring in coaches and therapists and we'd all work together so uh, it really was the first time I saw an integrated sport team work really really well together so uh, put yourself out there and really you know delve into that national team experience and and not a, just national team but professional team whatever it might be high school doesn't matter but put yourself in a position to learn um, and if you do that then it, the rest takes care of itself yeah, ma massive, massive. I'll give you a breather. That was amazingly deep, and I'm over here taking notes, trying to keep up. Um, good thing we're recording this. We can come back to it. Um, integrated and collaborative, like these are things that jump out at me now more than ever before in my career, is eliminating the boundaries between professionals, respecting another professional enough to say, I don't know this, you know this better than me, or maybe we can do this together on a level. And even going back to your student days with Darren, you know, Darren was at York uh, doing some stuff when I was there and, and some amazing work that was way over my head and over my skis that's led to some of the stuff that I've studied since. And you touch on courses and, and through the, the, the chats that we've had on here, the sessions that I've had, I've, I've thrown out a bunch of them and I'm doing the Altus Performance Therapy course right now online. And, and what a huge resource in terms of just the way you think as opposed to like and somebody asked me they're like what do you get out of it do you get a credential do you get something and I was like what do you get out of it you get a complete overhaul to the way that you've ever looked at anything before uh, forget the certificate on the wall but just listening to somebody from a completely different perspective and, and looking at things from a different light and Scotty's name came up in that obviously a bunch he, he's done a bunch of work with them and um, Scott Livingston is, is our actually he's going to be the next nice segue by the way which you didn't even know he's going to be on this week he'll be on uh, on here on Wednesday and uh, and you mentioned all this reading and all the things that you keep up on um, Tiger King yes or no no I've never watched it never watched it beautiful we do this on a, on a regular basis and that was a firm no not even close so that ties it up at 6-6 six, six for all those that that still care about that uh, in, our, in terms of our guests that are watching it or aren't watching it. Um, yeah, you touch on a whole bunch of things that are super valuable, Steve, and, and just hearing you speak is amazing. And you talk about those, the smiling from ear to ear, I can't wipe it off. So you're, you're still that for me, just so you know, and I'm saying that in public um, so that everybody hears it. Uh, you brought up a few things yesterday and I, I didn't want to jump in too deeply into like what you're doing in your systems and structures. I really wanted to get more of your career and, and a lot of the questions that you've answered have provided so much depth already. Um, yesterday you touched on, on uh, a four by four matrix that the great cook, the matrix of the four by four matrix. I'll pull it up here in a second and it's on my screen. And I just have the four by four matrix, the chaos matrix that they use in the Altus performance um, I'll just put this slide up and, and just let me see what you think. Um, let me see if I can get you to just look. You haven't seen this before and nobody else has, but I, I look at this and this is just a slide I threw together as you were coming on after seeing your discussion yesterday. And this is the four by four matrix of the SFMA over here. And then the Altus um, performance therapy metrics of the, the chaos metrics uh, matrix. I'm sorry. I can't keep up with my brain. Um, the matrix over here, the chaos matrix. And, and then my thought was like, systems versus black and white thinking and in the altus performance therapy course they talk about black and white thinking which is what's down here in red ironically enough it's in black and white too but uh how to sort of staying away from black and white thinking and relying more on like a system and a structure uh, and having something to go back to i don't know your take on this slide or just like your usage of systems and how important that is versus uh this bottom corner down here which we get we've all got stuck in at some point in our career 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting for me, like, especially early on in my career, Scott impacted me a lot because in his first re recondition course in 2007, I think I took it, uh, 2006, um, you know, I remember actually Greg Cook coming to his facility and running the FMS by him uh, before it was ever produced. Uh, and Scott just delving in and talking about the screens and what he liked, what he didn't like. And obviously he had great res respect or great cook had great respect for him at the time. And, um, and he's obviously uh, mentioned in, in uh, the, the book movement, which is Gray's newer version of, of the breakout of the SFMA, but systems is what's more important than, uh, you know, uh, solid structure. You've got to have principles of exercise prescription. Um, that makes sense to you that you can rely on and stay state why you're doing what you're doing more than knowing a ton of exercises. And that's what we try and get across to our students is before we teach them any exercises period, they have to know the principles. And then we relate by, back to the principles consistently to educate them on why we're choosing this exercise at this point in order to support that. I think, you know, at U of T, they're doing a great job. Uh, Dave, Fro um, uh, Dave Frost, Tyson Beach, Chris Chapman was teaching there for a period of time. Um, yeah, I think their their curriculum in, in uh, the the MPK program that they're doing there is very much like that. It's principles that provide the underpinnings as to why you do what you do. Um, and I think that's really what the 4x4 matrix taught me was here's a sound way to rationale why you do what you do. Even though even with the 4x4 matrix, it's not linear. It's, it's literally like undulating. You are picking at different points what you're going to do and why based off of what the patient is doing in front of you and what they're struggling with or excelling at. And I think that's really what the most important thing in exercise prescription is, is yes, it's important to learn exercises and learn their names and, and, and create your own library. And if there's anything that I did in the first probably five to six years of my career was, was really develop, you know, what are my progressions and regressions off of every exercise I know um, and, and make lists. And that goes for all parameters, not just your push, pull, lift carries, but your speed and agility work, your so linear speed, um, you know, change of direction speed, your agility, your plyometrics. I really delved into a ton of books. So even like Donald Chu's jumping, uh, jumping into plyometrics uh, was a great book for me, um, you know, where I just delved in and just started to learn exercise names, uh, modalities, and, and, and what is the right type to give at certain points what are the right progressions of exercise um you know once you start to put all those things together and obviously the fms courses teach you a ton of reconditioning exercises especially the sfma level two then you start to learn just how to prescribe those exercises and the rest takes care of itself but the underpinnings of theory um or principle is much more important than the exercise itself yeah yeah huge and to hear you say that um obviously goes a long way but having those those principles and the foundations and not just having them, but actually referring to them. And then you can always come back around to them or see how far you've progressed from or, you know, um, uh, gotten away from. So you always have a reference point when you have these things in place, which I think is also a, a, a huge point when it comes to exercise prescription, as well as rehab, right? Like you talked so much yesterday about, you know, clearance points and things like that when it comes to rehab. And, and you can walk into a large percentage of clinics um, in anywhere, really, and say, well, what are your clearance protocols? for x y and z and and you'll run into a roadblock like nobody has these things but these are these are principles that we learn in school you need to be able to achieve this this and this with a right knee injury that happened like this and this tissue was involved etc um, but sometimes we get a little bit um i don't know maybe we just get a little too hyper sped up in terms of getting to the end point and not really getting through those checkpoints in terms of clearance to play right for sure for yeah sure. Yeah, um, a couple good questions that I want to get to just so I don't go way down another rabbit hole with you because I could all night. Uh, any advice for young ATs looking to find a mentor? And let me jump in quickly because I'll just touch on this. The mentorship program is great with the CATA, I think. Um, it's building momentum. There's a lot of people who are in sort of like this not so young AT, but but not at the tail end, but also those tail like Glenn Bergeron's a part of it. And all these people have been uh, AT for a long time. Myself uh, included did the mentorship breakfast at the CATA conference. And, and the, this is the platform for me where uh, mentorship happens happens organically you know I have you on as a guest and you hit home with uh, person a B and C and then they reach out to you and, and start to dialogue a little bit or get an opportunity 
come see you when things are back up and running. Um, or like we had Scotty Howitt on and, and he hits home with somebody and, and these kinds of things. So um, my advice would be keep going to as many things that you can go to and listening to as many people as you can listen to. And just like finding courses, you'll find your niche. You'll find somebody that you click with, that you connect with, that you like the information they're providing or the way they are, or that they're challenging your way of thinking. And that's an easy way to find a mentor that will go a long, long, long way. Steve, your opinion, your take on that one. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I think I've never said no to anyone with passion. So as long as you show me that you're driven, you want to learn, uh, you're willing to put in the time or the hours to commute or come and visit, uh, we don't turn people away. I think there's this, this mystique out there that people don't want to mentor. Or, uh, you know, I think most people in our field want to mentor, want to help. Uh, and I think it's as simple as you know, what I, I see young coaches doing now more than ever is sending emails and requesting to come in and just take a visit. Uh, and not asking like, you know, the moon on the first email, but just saying, can I come and chat with you? That's it. That's all you have to do. And then go and show up and, and sit down with that person and, and, you know, just ask for a half an hour. That's it. Don't, don't be overburdening on their, on their time, but just come and visit and let them get to know you and see that you're serious about learning. And then that usually opens up to the next one and the next one and you slowly build it. It's like a relationship, uh, with someone that you're looking to court or date. Like it's not... We're getting married off the first one. It's all right. You know, here's the first speed dating meeting and then let's see where it builds from there. So uh, it's a silly analogy, but it's just the truth. Like it, it literally is half an hour and then the next, maybe a month later, you're coming back and then you slowly build it. So, you know, this is someone you want to learn from. You're also getting to know them, right? Like that's the other thing I say in interviews. I forgot to mention is interviews is a two way street. When you do an interview, you're getting interviewed, but when they ask, ask you if you have any questions, it's your turn to get to know if that's who you want to work with and learn from. And that's what I find most young people, they get so nervous for an interview when it should be, their mentality should be, I want to know if I want to work with you too. Um, and not that you're on the hot seat, that both parties are on the hot seat. So I forgot to mention that earlier, but it's, that's one thing that drives me nuts with, with young people interviewing. Um, but, you know, that's been my big thing in looking for mentorship. Um, and truthfully, Scott was my first and major one. I haven't looked for a lot of mentors since until I got my new role as uh, you know managing sport med and sport performance. I had to find someone else who was doing it. Uh, and truthfully, one of the one of the ones that was recommended to me was Art Horn, who's the director of uh, sport performance for the Boston Celtics. He's a former uh, Canadian guy, worked yeah. at Northwestern University. Uh, so I reached out to him and had a few phone calls. And, and you know, I haven't bothered him a lot, but I have chatted with him to the point where we spent hours on the phone and just. You know, he's, he's, he's told me everything that I would need to know for my position to, to work well and what he's found works and doesn't work at both the NBA, but also when he worked at uh, an NCAA school. So I think it's always important to find people who have done it, you know, more than you at the role you want to get to and find out, you know, just you know, maybe uh, you learn from their mistakes and, and they can uh, change some things for you. But that's a big thing, man. Reach out and, and, and get to know them and, and go and, and hang out with them. Um, or even here, I've had so many people that I would say a lot, but there's a lot of people that have reached out during these times and said, can I meet with you on life size or zoom? And it's so much easier. You don't have to travel. You don't have to commute. And I don't see why we wouldn't use this technology more moving forward. Yeah. Amazing. And, and, uh, art, art was in Boston. I went, I went down to Boston for a conference and oh, what a great speaker. So art horn is a huge resource. There's lots of stuff out there with him. I think he's still doing a bunch of courses and, and input and stuff like that as well. And, um, uh, Andrew, Andrew Paul was another one with OKC. He presented at, uh, with the OKC Thunder. He presented at, um, at the NSCA conference last year in Indianapolis. And I've been trying to chase him down for a while. Just the, the system they have in place, you know, they have nine, pref nine, uh, nine different professionals working with, with 12 to 14 athletes, a little bit of a different situation, but what a system they're running there. It seems, uh, uh, the daily, the daily updates and things like that are amazing that they do with their athletes. Um, Another one came in, uh, any advice for an AT that doesn't have a strength and conditioning program or coach for the athletes? Do you mean at the collegiate sector or? Yeah, this, this came in from, uh, from a university setting, uh, not in uh, the budget is, is, is quite an issue at this university, doesn't matter where it is, but um, they're not, they're not going to have an, a strength coach anytime soon. So what would you advise uh, if they're there, uh, if there's two therapists, two trainers there, uh, looking to make an impact uh, on the strength side of things as well? Um, I would say, number one, I just shared, um, I think I just shared it. I'm not sure if it came through yet uh, in the chat. Uh, yeah, I just put it, sorry, it came yeah. through as a, as a 
that last link I just put in for the Canadian Strategic Coaches Association, I would be, uh, subscribe to that. Um, get to know a bit about what, what is being done. They haven't delved into the bells and whistles yet, but this is what I would say. Um, if there isn't a strengthening coach there, uh, if you have a kin program, maybe there is a student that's in their upper years that, you know, maybe you can interview, create, like, you know, do an interview, work with some of the personal trainers that are working in the recreation center. There might be someone there that can start to help just provide programming. Uh, the second thing that I've seen done at some universities is they hire an outside contractor. Uh, at much less, than, and it's not the best way to do it because you're bringing someone from the outside in um, that doesn't bleed the same school colors that you do, and it's hard to establish a culture. But if you're just looking for, you know, enhanced uh, fitness and, and training for your athletes, sometimes it helps just to find a local training center where their staff may want to come in and be hired for. I don't know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar kind of stipend rather than a full salary, and and, and start to pro provide programming for your athletes. Uh, that would be something that I think would be probably one of the better steps to to take, in interim wise, until the university realizes what a benefit it is, and then you know go from there. The, the other thing I would suggest is send, you know, your, or, or I suggest your administrators to contact associate directors like myself so we can discuss the benefits and why they haven't done it yet and why they should. And the last thing I'll say is Brock wasn't in a position to, to, to afford it either. What we had to do was create a community model, which is part of our, our strategic plan, regardless of the university, is to impact the local surrounding community and bring in community teams to train. We charge the teams a certain amount, say $8 per athlete per session, twice a week, 20 athletes. You do the math for a year. You know, you're, you're talking $700 an athlete. Multiply that by, say, five, 10 teams. And all of a sudden, you have the funds to cover the, the cost for a strengthening program, um, or at least one or two full-time coaches. Um, and so sometimes you got to think outside the box. I think a lot of universities just wait for it to magically happen versus go out and get it. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, that's something where I'm not – I don't think that strengthening coaches should uh, be the only professional that, that has to, you know, generate some revenue for the university – to, to even be hired by any means. It's my hope that one day we don't have to do any revenue generation because we are such a, uh, because transition coaches are uh, um, great contributors to the experience at a university. Um, but I would say, uh, you know, it takes, you know, your upper administration, uh, your athletic directors, they have to reach out and find out what are other ways to do it and get creative uh, in order to make things happen. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and, and sort of what I was, uh, where I was going, I was just messaging as you were talking because it was a, a private message, and you just said, "Yeah, try, try." You don't want to onload it onto your plate as a, a head therapist or somebody, a head trainer at a program that's going to make it uh, a lot thinner. Um, yeah. But one thought came to mind is um, also just maybe thinning out the clinical hours that are empty and moving those hours into like a preventative model where you can go to the field, to the court, do these things, and get that type of uh, strength and conditioning work in. Uh, at the field with the coaching staff there and then build it out from that way. Uh, so long as you're not adding 16, you know, 16 hours a day to, to already long days, it just everybody will get worn out that way and it won't be quality. So um, just got to get creative with it and, and do our best to, to make it work. Um, yeah. Yeah. So some really good resources you've posted. Um, the hard no on, uh, on Tiger King, I applaud. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and uh, let me just pull one more slide up, man, because I pulled I put one more slide together uh, for your presentation based off of yesterday, and uh, and this was it. You know, these are some of the themes that keep coming up over and over again with all the guests on here, and, and this the top two lines are from this Altus Performance Therapy course. Um, you've touched on some of these points already. The top is is a, a slogan I think that we all live by when we're in these fields, and then down below. You, you talked about yesterday, trusting the process at Brock in terms of how you're laying things out and how you're getting through things. And then the Stu McGill uh, response to just about every question that comes in on a personal nature is, how do I fix my client that, that has this, 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 and this? And, and his go-to is it depends. I have to do, I have to know the human in front of me. I have to do the assessment. And um, I think you've touched on all these, but in terms of the process uh, with regards to your career um, and how you've gotten to where you've got to, um, I mean, that's, that's easy to say looking back in time when we're young and or in the middle of our careers and looking to do something a little bit bigger. Uh, you know, we have to utilize networks for sure. But uh, um, looking back over your career, the process has been 
it has been a pretty good one, huh? Like you started at York as an AT student mm -hmm. and yep. then you made some connections. And then when did you jump into strength and conditioning? Like as you were doing that? Uh, truthfully, I, I've always been interested. Like, yeah, I guess strength and conditioning for me started when I was younger. I played football, uh, basketball, and, and uh, I later on beach volleyball, all at roughly provincial level or university level. So uh, football mainly university just for a year until I got the AT program and I was like, okay, I'm done with football. I got to study. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, the injuries that I sustained when I was younger and being in therapeutic clinics, looking at anatomy charts and, you know, neurological system, trigger point charts going, you know, I just became intrigued by the human body and training. And, and so I've always been into strength and conditioning. It was the visit, the trips, the necessary trips to the clinics because of injury that uh, like I think a lot of us brought on the interest in therapy uh, and how to heal the human body or at least try to reduce injury as well. And um, so the strength and conditioning piece for me has always been there. Um, you know, I, I should say I attended George Brown College first uh, and studied fitness and lifestyle management there, but always with an interest in athletes. Uh, and then got a placement with the high performance specialist at Young and Davisville, where the upper floor was all therapists. The bottom floor was transition coaches. Yeah. So the upper floor had Chris Jackson, uh, Chris Broadhurst, um, Rory Mullen is with the Raps now. Those are three guys that stand out to me that were on the top floor. And then the bottom floor uh, had transition coaches uh, like Matt Nickel. Um, uh, you know, and I was a student who got, there was 30 students that applied every year. I was the only collegiate student. And, uh, you know, Brian uh, Grasso, who was a year ahead of me at George Brown, got the placement the year ahead against 30 other university students. And he was the one who said, look, you got to do this. You can do this like I did. So I ended up applying, got it out of pure passion. And then that was my first exposure to multidisciplinary clinic where the therapists would treat, walk their, student, their, their athletes down, uh, NFL athletes, NCAA athletes. Uh, Tennis Canada, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, we had Wendell Clark and Ty Domi there. They would walk these athletes down and literally hand them off to the strength coach and say, this is what I want you to do right now. And I, I was a student transition coach. So we had million dollar Cybex agility reactors and high, high speed treadmills. And, and I just remember, and all every piece you would want to train an athlete. And I just remember learning how to train athletes at that time when I was in college. And then I ended up going to York to study concurrent uh, concurrent AT and Ken, you know, study from Tudor Bampa and, and Charlie Francis. Tudor Bampa was teaching periodization. Uh, Charlie Francis was try coaching on the track, and, and I just would sit there and watch and listen and learn. Um, and just watching all these things come come to light, I, I got into AT later. I was more in a transition first, but I got into AT because I knew I needed to learn how to rehab clients uh, and and, uh, and athletes. Um, but I knew that it was necessary to do both because if you're going to work with an athletic population, you look down the line of a basketball bench and, and of the 18 players, six or seven of them are dealing with an underlying issue at least that you have to deal with as a therapist. So uh, to me, it made sense to have to, to have a combination of both skills in order to be able to work with, with uh, athletes at the highest levels. Yeah, and it, it doesn't come easy, and it doesn't come uh, it doesn't come quickly. But uh, as you look back, it's, wow, some of the names that you've worked with, and at the time you didn't necessarily have googly eyes, or maybe you did. But looking back now, at all the things like it's uh, it's it's amazing to to hear, and uh, what a what a what a what a crazy. Uh, lineup of people you've gotten to work with and, and who you've become like I, I look to you for a lot of things um, and really respect all the time that you've taken uh, to be here and, and with all the students that you work with currently uh, all the professionals you work with and, and taking the time out tonight Steve I don't want to keep you too long man I know it's Mother's Day and happy Mother's Day again to everybody out there uh, listening um, and uh, Steve man uh, we'll be in touch I need to have a conversation with you off, off camera at some point um, on, a, on a different note. And uh, again, really, really appreciate this. All the young therapists out there, all the therapists that have been practicing for a long time, anybody on the call, anybody who's going to pick up this, uh, uh, this video in the future, huge value in, in, in everything that you do and all the words and wisdom that you've shared again tonight, Steve. Thank you so much for being here, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for hosting this. And uh, I look forward to checking it out in the next little bit as well. I want to hear Scotty talk next week. So looking forward to it.
Yeah, he'll be on Wednesday night. So thanks a lot, Steve. I'll let you go. And anybody else who's willing to stick around, please do. I'm on here for a little bit longer to chat. And uh, this week coming up on Let's Chat, we have Scott Livingston on Wednesday evening. And next Sunday will be Dr. Sagar Desai. He's an orthopedic surgeon at Humber River uh, Regional Hospital, specializing in ankle and uh, foot. Uh, massive insight coming up this week again. Steve Lidstone, our guest tonight on Let's Chat and Athletic Therapy Roundtable, session 12. Thank you all so much for being here. Steve, all the best. And everybody else, we'll talk to you soon. Good night. All right.